MapChats. Hello, and welcome to our inaugural edition of MapChats, a webinar dedicated to all things data and mapping. This is a re-recording of our introduction of our first inaugural MapChats. Today we'll be talking about maps and data in the classroom, and we'll hear from three experts who teach GIS in their classes. My name is Katie Nelson, and I'm your moderator today. I'm Associate Director of Data and Product Development here at PolicyMap, which means I work on improving our data tools and on making sure that all the data we offer is quality, accurate, and up-to-date. But I'm excited to be wearing the moderator hat for this webinar because I have had experience teaching GIS to undergrad and graduate students at the University of Pennsylvania over the last three years. So I know firsthand how challenging and how fun it can be. Finding the right balance between teaching students how to think spatially and teaching them to use technology, or figuring out how to balance web-based and desktop technologies were some of the challenges that I faced. Before we jump in, let me give you an agenda for our talk today. Each of our speakers uh, will talk for about eight minutes about how they use GIS in their courses, and that should leave us with a full 30 minutes for questions and for discussion. I prepared, I prepared a few questions ahead of time to help get the ball rolling. Our first speaker is Amy Hillier. Dr. Hillier is Associate Professor of City and Regional Planning at the School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. She holds a secondary faculty appointment at the School of Social Policy and Practice. And I am forever in Dr. Hillier's debt as I got my start teaching GIS when Amy asked me to hover, cover her class when she went on leave with her son. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Doc. With basic uh, thematic maps, you can do some great work. So let me just show you real quick this, uh, this series. This is a map by one of my graduate students in social work. Philadelphia um, has a public school crisis going on. Um, and uh, we've had 29 public schools closed because of low enrollment, because of lost population, and also because of the opening of charter schools. What I like about this map is it shows there's two different sets of locations. There's closing schools, um, and then there's receiving schools. So as schools close, so other schools receive those students. So that's what the lines connect, those two geographies. And often there's these related sets of geographies that you want to map. Um, and I thought it was very intriguing because she showed what the, not the specific path kids would take, but the connection between the closing school and the new school, and, and the, basically the territory that kids would have to travel from through to get to their new school. And she was concerned about that from a perspective of uh, education uh, achievement levels, but also of crime. Um, and there was there has been concern about kids literally walking through sort of new neighborhoods that are less familiar with it. They might have some hostilities. Um, so um, you know, she she created this map, um, and I you know would arguably would say that um, you know this map is making the proposition that the closing of schools. Um, uh, has has raises real issues about the the safety of kids, um, and I, I here's an image that I just pulled just to show this is a protest that was unrelated to that specific map, but that said close school closings equal more violence, uh, um, and I think that would be a really profound title, very provocative title for that set of maps. So let me show you a couple more. Um, this one's maybe a little bit more lighthearted. I encourage students to, to map their own data. I think that it's critical uh, not to just uh, map canned data that somebody else gave you, uh, because until you map the stuff that you care about, I don't think you really own the skills. Uh, and I also find students to, to stay much more in engaged. Um, so this is a map that one of my students made while he was watching the NCAA uh, Sweet 16 um, and was able to uh, identify this pattern whereby kids who had been trained to play basketball grew up in Chicago were playing for other universities that were in the Sweet 16. There were no Chicago universities in the Sweet 16. There were all these other ones, and they were exporting talent. And I thought that was a you know pretty profound. Profound. And again, this idea of making an argument, making a proposition that Chicago's exporting all this talent, um, perhaps that. Um, these other places are are stealing the talent. Um, you know, you could use different language, but I thought it was a, a pretty intriguing map. Um, here's another one that uh, that I call the sort of the un-GIS map. Um, the map at the top, uh, Sophia Che was a doctoral student when she made these. The map at the top shows the conventional thematic map um, that's very precise in terms of geography and area. Um, but one of the problems is that area can 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 falsely give you a sense of importance. So 
parts of Russia and China are enormous, um, but not necessarily have much population. Um, Iceland shows up on a map. Greenland, um, even though these are places that don't have much population. A cartogram is a way, um, and it's something you can do within ArcGIS now, where you can uh, re um, you can reshape your map so that what's higher concentrations, higher values of whatever you're mapping make make that area larger and look more important. So this is a map of maternal mortality, which is uh, counts um, how many women die either in childbirth or near close after, and that this is not something that happens very often in the United States now in most developed countries, but you can see in Africa, um, and the shades of blue show something uh, of that sort of disparity. But when you see it in a cartogram format, um, I think you see it much more, uh, much more dramatically. And, and I've sort of dubbed this, call this map, um, the world weeps with Africa, because I think the cartogram gives you the sense of sort of this drawn out. Um, but again, really accenting this idea about this is problematic. Um, this is something that really needs to be addressed. I'm going to show you a, a video. Um, one thing that my students have been doing uh, more and more is making animation, because showing things change over space is one thing, but changing, showing change over space over time um, is another. Um, and this is um, one student mapped uh, changes to the uh, same-sex marriage laws across the country, which I think most of you probably know have changed rather dramatically um, in recent years. So before I play the animation, I just wanted to show you that um, the, the, the states in this map in orange are states that had no rulings initially, um, and then the yellow states had banned same-sex marriage, and then the blue states had allowed it. So in 1996, you see there's no blue states. And I'm just going to play this, and you're going to see some pretty dramatic transformation. Um, so in 1998, 99, um, you start to see more states banning it. Um, and then you see Massachusetts pop up in 2004, challenging the Defense of Marriage Act and legalizing marriage. Um, then you start to see regionally in New England some big change and then other parts of the country. And then 2014, you see the whole thing blow up. And of course, this map is actually out of date. It was made in December, and there's been subsequent court um, rulings. So I said, I think you know, we could think about this um, maybe as a, a civil rights quote, until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream, this idea of, of change, if it starts to build momentum. Um, then it could be like a mighty stream. I'm just going to show you two last quick maps, one of mine and one by um, someone who I really idolize. Um, Philadelphia's got a pretty significant problem um, with tobacco advertising and sugary beverage advertising. Well, that translates into consumption. Um, and this is work that I did. We did a lot of field work, collected a lot of data. Um, and the map that I have, it's a, it's a little, maybe a little more complicated than some of the others. Um, but my choice of red was pretty deliberate. These are areas that are concentrated. Um, they have significantly more tobacco advertising than you would expect if there was an even distribution based on the population. So this uses something called Ripley's uh, local K function, um, but the, the red is meant to show um, dramatic um, you know, areas of real concern, um, possibly on fire. Um, Center City is the only area that's not also high poverty. The poverty is shown by the, with the dots, um, and that's because Center City is where the business district is, so there's a lot of people um, working there. Um, I also have smoking rates in here, so you can see that the areas where there's high concentrations of advertising are often uh, also areas that there's often um, high smoke rates. Um, so in terms of you know, a proposition, I think this is obviously very selective, sort of what I've chosen to map, um, that Philadelphia um, has a pretty significant problem um, and that, that this is something that, that needs attention. Actually, I have two last maps. I was really surprised when one of my students came up with this um, in, in December. Um, Philadelphia has had an active um, Black Lives Matters uh, movement um, and following um, some of the recent um, police shootings, um, and I was stunned to see that one of my students had been able to find data from the Philadelphia Police Department on officer-involved shootings. Um, and this is where he was at. This was the stuff that he really cared about, and the only way he was going to get interested in the GIS class is if he could map some of the stuff he was interested in. And so I think this is pretty provocative, um, a pretty strong map um, that, show, that that he shows, uh, you know, saying that there's a racial bias and where there is 
officer-involved shootings as this is happening in predominantly black neighborhoods. Um, again, I think it's really important to meet students where they are um, and let them find data um, and so that they can make propositions. Um, last map um, of a, a hero of mine, Laura Kurgan, who with the Social Justice Mapping Center in Columbia and some, and some colleagues up there made what I think are one of the most profound set of maps um, that were on display at the Museum of Modern Art um, called the Million Dollar Block Map. Um, and these maps used data about the prison system, uh, the, the expense of, of incarcerating people, and, and they associated those expenses with the home block. So a million dollar block is a block in, in so in this case, Bronzeville, Brooklyn, where the state was spending a million dollars or more to incarcerate men from that block. And it was a very provocative way of getting people to think about, you know, how are we investing in these communities? Is locking people up really a way of investing in these? I think the fact that these were at the Museum of Modern Art really um, accents the, the point um, that these are not just data representations, that they're provocations, they're propositions, um, and that uh, it's our responsibility to, to tell stories um, and to, to make people think with our maps. Um, I, I think it's. I mean, well, I think it's really interesting how um, you really push using maps to to tell a story. And I think we think here a lot about um, using mapping and data to help you explore the content you're interested in. But um, you come. It almost like sounds like from like an opposite perspective of teaching mapping by encouraging people to to study and map the things that they care about. So that's. Thank you. Um, our second speaker is um, Dr. Elaine Pruitt um, at the University from the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences College of Public Health. Um, Dr. Pruitt is an associate professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the College of Public Health. Her research focuses on obesity and African Americans, translational research, nutrition in chronic disease, food and nutrition policy, and health disparities. Uh, she teaches courses on grantmanship and funding, nutrition policy and intervention, and advanced methods in health disparities research. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pruitt. Okay, thank you very much for, first of all, to the, to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Um, this is a, a wonderful opportunity, I feel, to really display the, the, the technology and, and how it has such broad applications. And in my case, I'm not trained as a geographer. I'm trained as a nutritionist uh, in public health uh, with also, uh, also having training in epidemiology. And so um, one of the things that I'd like to, to, to say is that I um, have really found this to be, uh, the technology of GIS to be an invaluable asset uh, in one of my courses on food policy and, and uh, programs. And so I will talk a little bit about that today. And rather than having maps, my students basically come from disciplines of health behavior, epidemiology, um, and um, environmental health. And I, those students come to my class with varying degrees of, of interest and background in nutrition. And from a public health perspective, this technology has been invaluable in, uh, in um, shaping their interest. So I'd just like to give you a basic overview of what I'm going to talk about in my next few minutes, just to give you a sense of what public health is when I'm talking about public health so that there's kind of a common, you have a kind of common um, concept of what I'm talking about and how we think about public health in comparison to medical care. Um, and then it's applications in public health and I'll use GIS, um, the application of GIS in my food uh, access, food policy course and the unit that I discuss on food access and health. So in general when we're talking about public health we're talking about the various definitions um, and these are just some examples to just show where um, those definitions have come from, varying uh, sources, but it's basically the science and art of preventing disease and addressing health in populations. It um, also seeks to fulfill society's interest in assuring conditions in which people can be healthy. And the other point that I'd like to make is that it is a multidisciplinary field with the goal of promoting health for, our popul for populations through organized community and policy efforts. So when we think about public health, people, you hear about public health in the news a lot, typically with epidemics or outbreaks or uh, they can be either food-borne illnesses or uh, the information in the news now about the Ebola virus, all of those. But when we think about public health and what it is, 
uh, we can compare it to medical care in several ways. So we're, when we're talking about public health, we're going to talk about the community as the patient, so to speak, when we're, we're comparing it to uh, medical care. And we're talking about the health of the population and preventing disease and addressing those conditions so that a goal is to be sure that or to, to institute programs, policies, to collect science and evidence that addresses the context within which uh, people live and uh, to foster efforts that would promote um, health and well-being. So um, again, we use the scientific knowledge to develop policies and programs that support and improve uh, community health. So here are some, just a few of the applications. There are many, but I just to give you kind of a flavor of what I use the GIS uh, software packages for um, in my class, uh, it's, very, it's a very rich resource uh, in understanding demographics, neighborhood characteristics, the distribution of community resources in terms of where it is, what's the, what uh, is available, what are the ordinances and policies that are barriers or facilitators to um, implementation of policy and programs, and also issues around the structural determinants of health. And it's very important in public health, one of the things that we look at in terms of change is looking at health, community health indicators. So GIS as a, as a, as a um, field and in terms of its utility is very invaluable in terms of understanding the, the health status of health indicators in varying, various communities and what they look like and how they might change over time. So um, I wanted to just, as I said on my initial um, outline here, was just to talk a little bit about how I've used GIS as a nutritionist, so the public health nutritionist uh, with interest in population health and assuring that uh, food equity and ju food justice, so to speak, um, as a um, feature of the uh, broad environment within which uh, people can be successful and live healthy lives. Um, as a background in my course, I basically uh, set the stage with people under, with the students understanding that there are national guidelines for dietary patterns to reduce the risk of chronic disease. And so we hear a lot on, in the news and the students remind me frequently, they say, Dr. Pruitt, the recommendations change every day. Yesterday I couldn't eat sodium, today I should drink more coffee. So we always have these, these discussions, but, but the, the bottom line that we get to is that there is science that supports the, um, the role, the uh, important role of healthy eating in terms of lowering risk for chronic disease. And so when we think about public health, we think about ac uh, equity and access and availability to these foods that we know are associated with healthful living and well-being. And we have data that shows that inequity of access to these food uh, items undermines health in particular communities. And these communities include low uh, SES population groups, persons who live in rural areas, so they're geographic areas in ter terms of rural and urban um, differences, in minority, ethnic minority populations, and other underserved and underreached uh, populations. Population. So, so given those inequities that we know exist, it, it really uh, uh, illustrates to, to the students how important it is to understand these, uh, these, these inequities and to visually see what these inequities are, what the spatial implications are, and other um, factors that under, underlie uh, these inequities. So one of the things that I, I try to do in the course, and the, the students, we use case discussions, is to look at what are the public health principles that we're talking about here. So if we're talking about, from a general uh, global uh, understanding of public health, we're talking about the dis distribution of community resources in terms of access and availability. We talk about the, uh, in public health, we're talking about characterizing environmental quality, and, and in my case, it's food. Um, and mapping contextual barriers and facilitators to healthy living and issues about program policies and development. So one of the things that we use the GIS data for in, our, in my class, um, and we happen to use um, one software, a policy map in particular, and others, uh, but we use that uh, quite a bit, is to look at, in terms of the distribution of resources, 
in terms of access and availability related to public health, we're able to look at the location of full-service grocery stores by zip code, by region, and community characteristics. And it's very insightful for students to see, particularly we, particularly we use uh, Little Rock because it was the uh, one of seven uh, southern cities that were, were studied um, within the last six or seven years, uh, metropolitan southern cities looking at uh, the access to healthy food and retail uh, expenditures for food uh, in those communities. So we're able to actually look at that data, where they are by zip code here in, in Little Rock. We also are able to look at the equity of access to healthy food, and that means we're able to see where are these grocery stores located, where are their um, situations and circumstances that prevent access to um, full-service grocery stores? Are there distance issues? Are there transportation issues? What are, what's the environmental milieu within which these people are embed, embedded that further undermines what we know is their access to healthy food? We also talk about the types of food stack stores. There's a lot of information in terms of the quality of what's available, in terms of dollar station, dollar stores, gas stations, where people buy food, particularly if they're uh, receiving uh, domestic assistance programs such as SNAP, which was formerly known as food stamps. So we're able to see where those cluster and how they uh, relate to where people live and what they do and how they shop for food. And finally, we're also able, even particularly from the work that I mentioned earlier in um, the southern metropolitan cities, to talk about economic capital as an impetus for improving access to healthy food in communities. In other words, um, we, the study by the Brookings Institution in the southern uh, metropolitan uh, cities looked at um, how much retail uh, money is going out of neighborhoods that could be spent in those neighborhoods if there was a full food, uh, full service grocery store there. So understanding what the, that capital is and using that information um, provides the, the data that is used by developers and other um, officials in making determin, uh, determining where our resources can go and whether or not we can build other grocery stores or other uh, assets in the food system to support healthy eating and access to food. And so in my summary here, I just want to say that I found in my class and for my students, we have a very interactive discussion about it's a valuable tool for examining and understanding the community context and conditions that influence the health of populations as such. And the information has been particularly invaluable in students understanding the development and implementation of programs and policies. And this provides what, what we term in public health evidence-based efforts so that the information is credible, that is, it is sensitive to the environment, and that it can be per, per, uh, perceived um, in a way that is informative to um, the development of local, regional, and national programs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Um, our final speaker is Jessica Deegan. Um, Jessica Deegan is, a G is the GIS coordinator and research specialist for Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Um, Jessica holds a master's degree in geographic information science and a bachelor's degree in housing studies from the University of Minnesota. Um, and she's been teaching since 2004 um, as uh, adjunct faculty at the University of Minnesota's Housing Studies Program. So she teaches coursework um, on GIS and research methods for housing market assessment and analysis. All right, great. Well, thank you to PolicyMap for inviting me to participate today. Um, as Katie mentioned, I'm adjunct faculty in the program, and thus I am not an academic by trade. My day job is with the state's housing finance agency, Minnesota Housing, where my role is as a researcher and GIS coordinator with the organization. I've been in state government in an applied GIS and research role for the last decade. So I teach just one course each semester called um, Understanding Housing Assessment and Analysis. And this course came into fruition while I was a graduate research assistant with Jeff Crump at the university. And after 10 years, I'm still coming back each year to teach the class and find that it's um, really valuable for me as a practitioner as well as for the students. So I'm going to really focus on this individual course rather than the, the work I'm doing um, in 
policy, um, but my course is a research methods course that's geared towards upper level undergraduate students in the housing studies and urban studies programs on campus. We also attract a lot of students from architecture and public policy, and I even get the occasional graphic designer in the class. What I don't have in this course are geography students for anybody with any computer science background. So these students are coming into my class knowing a thing or two about housing and community development. And in fact, a course on housing and community development is a prerequisite to take the class. There are no prerequisites, any technology related at all. So I get a lot of interesting mixes of students in terms of their technology skills. Um, and I get some really technically savvy students intermixed with those who um, are uncomfortable even with Excel spreadsheets. However, I've noticed in the decade that I've taught the course, I'm finding that most students now have a really good base of technology that makes it a little easier to springboard into, say, a desktop GIS package, and they're all familiar with consumer maps. Ultimately, I approach this course from the perspective of a future employer. That's my applied side, and I build learning goals around that. So what would I want a potential employer to understand, or a potential employee to understand about GIS and to know about data analysis and cartography? Can this person navigate the pitfalls of gathering data, effectively map and analyze that data, and perhaps more importantly, understand the context and the resultant that their map or data analysis fits. And Amy noted that you know, the responsibility of being a map maker is, is really key, and I think students need to learn that the decisions they make and how they're presenting their data um, could have significant impacts on a public policy perspective. So one of the things I think about a lot in this class is whether desktop GIS was the right option or is the right option and whether to continue to do that. I've historically hit the ground running in the class learning desktop GIS, and I found students were getting pretty frustrated right away with the software. It was a bit overwhelming. Um, so I wanted to provide some quick wins that allowed them to explore maps and data right away before learning the mechanics of data and, and, and making changes in cartography and geocoding and querying data and all that. So I was really excited to learn last year that the university had obtained a site license for policy map because now in my first lab session, I can introduce students to the types of information and content that they already have a base level of understanding on through their course, other coursework in, in housing and urban policy. So in other words, they know what a HUD Section 8 public housing development is and about the impending influx of senior housing um, as baby boomers age, but they don't know anything about polygons or data structures. So after a quick win and, and they get really excited about the idea of mapping and the kind of information they can present, then I move back into the desktop tools a little more, going back and forth between the desktop and online tools like Policy Map. We use um, the census is on the map for the origin destination data. I use HUD's eGIS tools, et cetera. So we turn back to that desktop GIS because I'm going back to what skills are marketable as they go out into the workplace into their policy and planning type positions. So a couple lab examples through our, we do a weekly lab session and we learn applied dark GIS from the ground up. Um, while applying this tool to a range of housing issues, such as senior housing needs, evaluating foreclosure patterns, understanding the connections between where people live and work, um, mortgage market analysis, and more. And I also try to not do any canned lab exercises that come with pre-processed data because there are no canned projects in the real world. And I want students to not be completely overwhelmed when they go to do their first GIS project on the job. So with that, I spend a fair amount of time discussing metadata and what to look for in data. And I even have a lab session on cleaning up ugly data to get it ready for making a map. Um, the students, the, the labs that they're compete, completing are meant to reflect a GIS project in a typical public policy setting, which is really an extension of my day job. So I set up my labs to establish best practices with regards to how to set up projects and store your data and cartographic graphic output and analysis, and then that sensitivity on what you're displaying and how that matters. So this um, lab is showing an example. This is a lab that we did on looking at 
creating a fictional target program for new, um, new homeowners where um, the connection would be to transit. So we were doing some really basic multi-criteria analysis to investigate where there might be a potential market for first-time home buyers near transit stations in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Another lab we do, I find the students just love spatial analyst and hotspot mapping. Um, so in this lab, we do a lot of we do a lot of talk and, and discussion around what it means to where people live and where they work and what that connection is, both from a transit perspective but also from a housing development perspective. And I like this particular lab assignment a lot because not only do they get to start using the more analytical capabilities in GIS with the density mapping, but they also have to do some processing of that data set from or the origin destination data from the longitudinal employer household dynamics program so before they can conduct the analysis. So they do have to do some data work before they can get to the icing on the cake of creating these hotspot maps. Through the course of the semester, we have a term project that they're working on. They do a poster presentation, which I've really enjoyed um, and, and has provided a good output for, for this class based in GIS. And it brings together their outside interest in housing and community development with GIS analysis. So they're required to establish a research question. Often their research question is related to, say, a senior paper or a broader topic that they're working on. And they do analysis and data gather data independently to provide what we hope to ultimately be uh, you know, a, a conference-ready poster presentation. So in this example from last semester, a student evaluated the long-term housing market effects uh, from the Grand Forks flood of 97 in East, eastern North Dakota. So he looked specifically at whether housing density and vacancy rates were affected by the flood, and then whether there had been a full recovery back to pre-flood conditions with regards to those characteristics. Another example from, from a poster is looking at gentrification, and this student wanted to evaluate property values and racial and demographic changes in a popular Minneapolis neighborhood to see whether there was evidence of gentrification. So these are just two examples of, of the content that students are bringing to the class before we teach some level of content, but spend a lot of our time um, identifying ways that we can take data and apply it to what they've been learning in policy so far. So in summary, I teach these students in a fashion that's going to give them some skills in creating successful maps and spatial analysis in the workplace if they're on a path towards public policy or the community development arenas. So they will not leave this class as experts in GIS, and I, they may even require additional technical training to be really good at the software, but they have a good sense of um, the pitfalls and, and specifically some of the things they need to be critical of as they're reading and creating their own maps. So with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Katie. Thank you. That, that was great. Thank you, Jessica. So we, um, we have quite a bit of time, I think, still for questions. Um, and I think we've received a couple of questions um, from people out there. Um, but don't hesitate to, to type in your questions. We're going to be um, segueing to that now. Um, I prepared a few questions to kind of get us started, um, and I think there should be a slide for that. Excellent. Um, so I think Jessica in particular spoke um, quite a bit to this question, but I'd be I'd love to to throw this out to all three of our um, panelists here. Um, each of you has um, an area of applied GIS that um, that you uh, that you teach. Do you find that um, you have to strike a balance between teaching te teaching GIS the technology and how to use it versus teaching the teaching your content area? Yeah, this is Amy. I'll take that first. If that's okay. Um, yeah, I have this challenge, um, and I think the most the most precious thing is the time. You know, the in class time, the instruction time, and I teach usually teach three hours a week, um, and and the students. You know, they, they say, oh, you know, the more lab, the better, the more hands-on GIS. But I insist on spending the first hour or so um, presenting some applications from the literature, from practice, um, so that you can see some, some really best cases. Um, I think, you know, my students are not geography students. None of them are studying GIS. 
Um, they're all studying G how to use GIS to affect social change, to understand cities. Um, and so that's by presenting examples um, from my own work and from other people's work, how I try to strike that balance. But it's a challenge. This is Jessica. I, I totally agree with Amy that I also I have a three-hour class and students would love to have that whole three hours in the lab, uh, but I spend an hour each day talking about best practices and, and, and what that means and why this matters and, and why these maps might make a difference and, and, and that kind of thing, but um, the balance is ongoing, right? And uh, I, I share those sentiments. I think uh, for me, since my course is not uh, is uh, focused on GIS or have, has a lab component at all in, in the area. It, it's confined to a unit, so it's very, it's very focused in terms of these students, as uh, previously mentioned, without a background in geography at all, but really wanting to understand how to use the software to get at the question and to understand mm -hmm. the environment, uh, the environmental context, barriers, that kind of thing. But once they get in, I have to, in all honesty, they really get excited about it. We have to, to uh, there are other units in the course that we have to cover, but, um, but, but striking that balance, you're right, is, has been, um, been an interesting uh, experience. So we have a, a question I think that's pretty related, um, and that's, what are the best ways to self-teach oneself GIS outside of the classroom? Are there certificate programs that are actually worth the cost? Hmm. <laughs> well, that's a great question. This is Jessica. We have, um, in, in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, there, there are some local vendors that do training, and there is recertified training that typically um, folks will send people to and, and you know it's a two or three day course if they need that crash course and we also have you know our state agencies consolidate and do training um, for among the agencies so we find that when we get people on the job if they're excited about GIS perhaps they've had that introductory class um, but they're not proficient completely yet we can do really short training if they want a certificate they could go on for that as well um, but I find that a couple weeks of training if they already have a base understanding makes a lot of difference in, in their effectiveness on the job mm -hmm. yeah I think it's uh, this is Amy that's that, that's a tough question I get it a lot um, and I always say well can you take a semester long GIS class that's that's the best way I can teach you and often the answer is no um, and um, I think that I don't think there's any one perfect online option. I think trying a bunch of having a different a bunch of different um, resources, um, mixing up with some in person. Um, I'm a real fan of learning software in a among within a community where you can help each other because anyone who's used GIS, you know, you you just bang your head against the wall and you know it's something simple. And if you could just ask someone, then you know you could save yourself hours. And so I, I find that that you know community, being able to have a, a group of people around you who you can ask is ideal. Now, of course, some people are, are just very well suited to this and they can pick up a manual um, and they can go to the races. Um, I, we've tried to come up with some you know, less formal, shorter options. We have a summer institute. Um, I have some of my students do tutoring. Um, but I think you know, whenever possible, if you can find some other people who are who are more further along in the process of learning GIS than you, who can answer questions, that that will really help. All right. Um, so we have a, a question from uh, Michael Johnson, um, which is, how do you integrate policy map and other web, ma web mapping applications into your courses, if at all? Yes, this is Amy. It sounds like I probably do that the least um, because my class is a GIS class and primarily people are finding data, downloading it directly from the Census Bureau into, um, you know, we, we are an Esri uh, site licensed university. Um, but I, but more and more, um, well, I find that it's great for folks to look at Policy Map and because we have a, a subscription um, and, and some of the other, um, we use Social Explorer um, 
and um, some of the other census products and community commons. To, I like to, to encourage students to look at to get a sense of the other kinds of data that are available that people are thinking about, um, you know, new analytical tools, thinking about really good practices. I know policy maps put a lot of effort into the design of their maps and the, the symbology and um, being able to see best um, best practices. Um, so I think, and I also, because we, we have students, some of whom are just going to be sort of consumers of maps, some, some who might make maps, and others more and more who are going to be expected to make online maps. Um, so I think seeing what some of the best, you know, best cases out there, like policy map, of, of online maps that are being used widely, uh, that those provide great examples for students, um, inspiration for them, um, if they're going to go into that business of creating online maps. Uh, one yeah. of the things that we typically do in, in my class in the, uh, the unit that I, I just mentioned, the section that we do on food access uh, using uh, GIS, um, is uh, it is integrated in, to the extent possible with information from community commons. And part of that is one of the reasons we, that I, we find that valuable. I, find it inv invaluable and for students, is to really make them more familiar with just the technique of how do you access data, what's available, um, how can it be overlaid uh, to, to create a picture, uh, a, 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 a portrait of, of a community or a setting. So uh, these student, the students that I teach is, uh, will not have the responsibility for, for making maps, that they're not trained in geography per se, but being able to, to integrate and overlay, so to speak, uh, various frames of, of, of data um, into a portrait is really what's been invaluable in terms of understanding what comes from where and what you can get and how useful that information is. Can you talk a little bit about community commons and what that is? Um, yes, it's um, I think it's it's through the CDC website, I, I think. But you, it's C, it's uh, communitycommons.gov, um, I think. And I will ask my colleagues to um, help me if I'm misspeaking here. But it provides a ver uh, a wealth of information about characteristics in the community. And for us, one of the things that I've been able to get at is uh, a rate of uh, domestic food assistance participation uh, in the population, the um, uh, populations with uh, free and reduced price lunches, all of that. And I've been able to look at it in for one uh, instance in particular. I was looking at it in different counties here in the state um, where we have um, high rates of food insecurity. So mm -hmm. it was very insightful to overlay that, to look at that in more the rural areas of the state, which are primarily along the Mississippi River collar communities along that, that collar compared to the more central areas. With Little Rock is the largest city, and just to look at that rural-urban comparison, so to speak, in community commons. Mm -hmm. So I want to um, I want to uh, jump to a slightly different question, which is um, all of you uh, talk in different ways about um, about your students getting excited about certain things. Could you talk about what you have found your students get most excited about as you teach GIS? And related to that, um, what, your, what your students find the most challenging when you're teaching them mapping? Well, from, I can just say just briefly that for my students, it's been uh, the fact that they just were not aware of the depth of the problem um, with food access in communities. And to actually see it. Uh, spatially and to understand what the implications are in terms of public health and the burden of chronic disease that are, um, that are prevalent here and that are um, um, various populations there. Um, it's been uh, very um, an, an eye-opening experience um, for students in, um, in my class. They just didn't know, and now they know. So, and they have the data to back up what they're uh, to to provide more in-depth insight mm -hmm. and to use in other classes. Yeah, when I, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, I agree with that. I think my students get really excited because they are able to either confirm their understanding of an issue spatially or allow them to see things differently. And usually it's, it's allowing them to see things differently. So they might, uh, mapping foreclosures with the, the recent residential foreclosure crisis, they might verify what they learned in their policy classes about predatory lending practice, um, but they might be also surprised that the crisis was so far spread and find areas that they didn't think were impacted. And so so it can really just change their view by looking at how the data are. And they're often just challenged by, by data and finding data and cleaning up that data and getting it into a form where they can um, present it on a map. And it's hard to switch then from all that cleanup mode and, and the processing to, again, going back to thinking about what, what it means and, and how, what the map is actually displaying. Yeah, when I started out, you know, 10 or 12 years ago teaching GIS, the biggest challenge was finding data. I mean, just like sh share out, like where do you, where can you possibly get it? People weren't giving it away, um, and now. Um, while I agree that there's still a lot of issues with finding good data and cleaning it and getting it GIS ready, the challenge is making sense of all that data out there. Like finding finding the good stuff, um, finding you know what what really represents what you want. Um, the, I think the you know, the challenges I have with students is, is 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 for some of them just getting over that initial hump of the of you know the learning curve, um, the 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 frustration of some of the quirky things in learning GIS, and it's you know it's a pretty different um, way of, of 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 thinking about data, looking at data. Um, but what I find balances that out um, is the motivation to you know, to, to, to make maps that matter, um, and it's, I think that's been the theme of this whole webinar is, is applied GIS. Um, like, I don't find that students are just excited about seeing things where people are just showing off, well, well, we can do this now because it's, you know, it's possible now with the new technology. It's like, well, so what? I mean, the folks that I have really want to change the world, um, and when they can see in my maps or maps of my colleagues or in, you know, other students' maps and in their own maps, uh, a chance to really affect change, to change the way people are, are understanding uh, problems um, and to help identify solutions, that that is the motivation that gets them through some of the technical challenges. Okay, so um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, it's, it, we've we've talked quite a bit today about um, the the changes in GIS technologies and how fast um, those changes are coming. How um, are you incorporating, or are you <coughs> choosing not to incorporate new technologies into your classes? It's really difficult to incorporate new technologies from class to class. I, my temptation is right now. I really want to go into interactive mapping, um, but short of teaching them some basic programming. I mean, they could do some some simple things using ArcGIS online, but I don't know if I want to go that route because I think I would take away some of the other um, important cart cartography lessons and, and things of that mm -hmm. nature. So, but I, but I feel like I need to get there at some point um, because that's what they're going to be working on and that's the, the medium they're going to be displaying their data. Um, so it's it's tempting and I think it's necessary, but it's really difficult to change the curriculum and, and include more when I don't want to get rid of anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get away with being kind of old school uh, because students who really want to do the more sophisticated stuff, you know, mine is the first class in what's an increasingly long sequence. So now we have a Python class that's focused on GIS and we have a web mapping class and we have advanced GIS class and we have raster GIS so that I don't feel like I have to, to do more and I sometimes think less is more and teaching the really basic critical thinking um, around mapping is 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 my job. Um, the the technology that I have, I, I, I introduced a little bit of web mapping just to give them a sense that you don't, there's so many tools out there that you can do this stuff fairly easily and then you can get very sophisticated with it, um, but just so they know um, some of the stuff. Um, I, I have chosen to integrate GPS. That's not a, you know, necessarily a new technology, um, but the fact that they can record GPS points of where they've been over the course of a week on their phone and then put that into a map that they annotate and um, sort of make sense of possibly in 3D is, um, I think, is, is helpful just so they're, they're aware of that kind of data. Okay. Um, I think uh, we have come to the end of our hour. Um, 
I want to thank each of our presenters. This has been a really, really interesting webinar. I, I feel like I have learned a lot, and I hope that um, I hope that all of you have as well. Um, our team here, Policy Map, um, we feel very strongly that data has the power to change communities. And one way that we try to achieve that is by making our data and our maps um, accessible to vast numbers of students throughout the country. Um, through subscriptions and site licenses. Um, and I was excited to host this webinar today to learn uh, more from experts about different approaches that they have to using data and maps um, to uh, enhance their classes and uh, to foster and promote a love of data and mapping that we have here at Policy Maps. So um, thank you, everyone, for that. Um, this webinar is going to be uh, available online at policymap.com slash mapchat. So if you came a little late, um, you should be able to, to check it out there. Um, we also have upcoming um, map chats. We have yet to schedule dates, but um, the topics that we have coming up over the next few months are going to be mapping food access, uh, creative placemaking, uh, and challenges to local health data. Uh, if so keep an eye out for those. And if you have um, other topics that you think would be interesting, please reach out to us and let us know. Um, we will uh, be sending you uh, a survey um, that should be coming to you, I'm guessing, within the next day. So look out for that and let us know um, what you thought uh, and how we might be able to make map chat better going down the, going down the line. Um, and I think that's it. If you have any questions, um, please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, thank you.